Hello, and welcome to the last video in my series on migrating Cisco IOS Catalyst switches to Juniper Junos EX switches. Up to this point, we've parsed out our configuration from our Cisco device. We've adapted that configuration into our EX4300. We've tested that all our VLANs and all of our routing works, and we've done some hardening to ensure that the switch is only accessible by resources that we define. In this video, we're going to build a virtual chassis. If you're coming over from Cisco, this will be analogous to a stack. Let's begin. As I mentioned in the intro, virtual chassis is akin to Cisco stacking. It lets you take multiple switching platforms, usually all the same model. We do also support some mixed modes where you can have variations with the same model set and present those as a single logical device on your network. When you have a virtual chassis, you have a device that is defined as an RE. This will be the control plane for the virtual chassis. And you also have a device that's defined as a BK or the backup routing engine. And this would be the device that is failed over to in the event that the RE ceases to function or is taken out of service. The reason that this is important is because the RE and the BK are constantly maintaining state Everything else in the virtual chassis is a line card and has a forwarding plane, but no active control plane, or I should say very little active control plane. There are ways to deploy a virtual chassis, pre-provisioned, as you can see up here, and non-pre-provisioned. Now we're gonna be focusing on non-pre-provisioned today. There's documentation, like the stuff you see over here, that will cover what these two modes are. Pre-provisioned, in a nutshell, allows the administrator to based on the serial number of the switches, define roles and who's going to be the line cards and what the virtual chassis member IDs are going to be. It's very prescriptive. A lot of folks use the non pre provision method, which actually allows you to just plug in the virtual chassis cables and you're off to the races. Now I say virtual chassis cables, we don't have dedicated cables these days, like Cisco had the StackWise stuff. Uh, we just use generally 40 gig DACs we can also build virtual chassis using 10 gig cables. And in fact, most of our platforms don't have dedicated virtual chassis ports. They have ports that may show up at, from the factory's virtual chassis ports, but they can be reassigned as typical revenue ports for uplink. The EX 4300s that we have, the non multi gig versions, have four 40 gig ports on the back next to the power. They show up from the factory as VC ports but we can reallocate them. And in fact, we're going to have to do that today because I went through all these switches already and there are some things we need to clean up. With some of our platforms, like the EX2300s, you simply define VC ports as you see fit, the 10 gig uplink ports usually on the 2300s because you can't use one gig ports. Um, you do that manually when you get the device. Some of the other caveats and considerations, if you're operating a mixed mode, you have to understand what switches interoperate with other switches, which ones have to be in that master and backup role, that RE and BK role in the virtual chassis, and if there's any special licensing considerations. We don't generally license the virtual chassis function on our EX platforms. The exception is the EX2300, but it's very inexpensive. Uh, the QFXs, some of them need a license, some of them don't. Just make sure you double check first. Every VC can have 10 members with two exceptions. You can create a virtual chassis with a pair of MX routers, but that's a two member chassis. And you can create VCs out of EX2300s, but you can only do four. That's some of the considerations we just covered. They all have to be on the same code version. They all have to run the same mode and I'll get into that in a moment when we get into the CLI and the virtual chassis ports, we kind of covered that as well. So yeah, let's just get into the CLI. This first device is the EX4300 that we already set up. It has our complete imported Cisco configuration, all the hardening, all the other bits, and the command we're gonna use first to just make sure this is ready to go is show virtual chassis status. Every switch that supports virtual chassis is going to show up and essentially consider itself a virtual chassis of one. That's good because there's no special commands to enable virtual chassis out of the box. You can just start plugging things on in. And as long as you know how the virtual chassis is electing that RE and BK role, you can, you know, guess the ordering. Most people, you know, we zero index, so you're gonna have zero through nine. It'll always 
add the next available number when you're creating a VC. And most people are going to have their master, their RE, that's going to be assigned to that zero value at the top of the virtual chassis. And then one will be the BK, and then two through nine are going to be LC or line cards. And you can do that without any config as long as you know how you what order you plug things in and how it makes the election choices. However, we do need to make sure that these two things match on all the switches. And we need to make sure that they match the actual operational mode we're going to be using. And in this case, both of these are incorrect. <laughs> this happens when I pull gear out of the demo pool sometimes because they'll zeroize the platform, which will blank the Junos config. But these are all operational mode commands. So unless you're booting it up and then checking this specifically, then you might get virtual chassis configuration that's been carried over from the previous person that was using this. Not a big deal, not their fault. This is the kind of thing you want to know about though, because if this actually happens to you, you'll pull your hair out trying to figure out why your virtual chassis isn't behaving. In this case, mixed mode refers to us using different types of platforms in the virtual chassis. We're not going to be doing that, so we need to disable this. Route mode is an F means that this is configured to support a virtual chassis fabric, a data center concept that actually allows you to use specific devices at a spine type layer and have up to 16 line cards for a total of 20 devices managed from a single control plane. We don't want that either. We're just doing VC. So we got to change both of those. We'll do that by saying request virtual chassis mode mixed disable. Since we're setting this back to default, there isn't, we don't actually add a different type of configuration here. We just remove the specialized config. And these do require a reboot. So if you have the opportunity, do this before you start trying to form your VC. This isn't going to be in production at this point anyway, but if you've got a one switch and you want to create a VC, just make sure you're checking these things first because you can see this does say reboot required here. And we're also going to run this and say mode fabric disable. And we can check this. This is pretty cool. We can do a show virtual chassis mode and it will tell us what our current state is, fabric with mixed devices, and what our next state is after the reboot, virtual chassis with similar devices. That's perfect. Now, the other thing that we need to check is our virtual chassis ports. And again, if you've got stuff that's fresh out of the box, likely you're not going to have to touch any of this. But since these are out of demo pool, because I also want to show you, this is how we verify our virtual chassis ports. Pick one, three, two, one, and zero. Now this maps to show chassis hardware, where we have a single FPC, so it doesn't even bother listing it up here. We can see on pick one, we have a four by 40 gig QSFP plus built in. It's on the back plane. So these map to this pick, and this is the state that you want to see them in right here, configured and absent. That just means that I haven't plugged in any of these 40 gig DACs yet. If I did plug in one, but didn't connect it to anything, it would say not connected. If this is completely blank, like we're about to see on this other switch, which is going to be eventually our second member or member ID one, because we zero index virtual chassis. If we do status for one, you'll see that we have the settings we expect here. You'll have to excuse this scroll since this has been zeroized. It's going to be constantly popping up these auto config messages. But if we check our VC ports, we'll see that it's blank. And that's because this showed up from demo pool uh, without the VC ports configured. Apparently the last person to use it was using those ports either for uplink or something else. So we need to set those. We'll do a request virtual chassis VC port set pick. We already know this is one and then port zero. And we'll just do this for each one, three. And then we should be able to run this and we'll see them again in the state that we want. Now we don't have to do a reboot for this, but we are gonna to have to reboot this first one. So I'm gonna do that, and after it's rebooted, I'm gonna go ahead and come back, I'll pause right now, and we'll start patching stuff together. All right, we're back from our reboot. Let's scroll down our instructions here a bit, and we can look at our setup section. Now at this point, we've confirmed everything's on the same version of code. We've got our VC ports all set up, we know that we're in the same mode. Well, we should double check that. Capacity, status. Yep, we see N and VC. That was what we wanted. Perfect. So how do we ensure that the device that we have already configured becomes the 
routing engine for the virtual chassis. There are three criteria that virtual chassis uses to determine which device is the RE, which device is the BK, which is the backup routing engine, and then everything else is a line card after that. The first criteria really only applies if you already have a virtual chassis and have rebooted devices. If that's the case, then the device that was the routing engine prior to the reboot will be the routing engine again. Now, this is not taking into account static configuration that you might have. If you're in pre-provisioned, you don't actually, the election process is deterministic based on your inputs. If you are non-pre-provisioned, but you have assigned what we call a mastership priority value to the FPC members, and when we see FPC, the member IDs will map to these FPC values, well, roughly. When I say that, you're always going to see FPC0 as the device because locally, there's it's a fixed system. It has a single FPC. But in a virtual chassis, when you're doing your interface numbering, that leading value, which is FPC, is also the member ID. So that's how you know your interfaces are configured for the specific members in that VC. We don't have a VC already built, so the whole who was the master before doesn't count because each of these devices, since they think they're in a VC of one, was its own master prior to the reboot. The second one is most common, again, in the absence of deterministic configuration, and that is uptime. The device that has been up the longest will be the device that is going to take that mastership priority. The third one is MAC addresses. You're never going to get that far because you're never going to have everything exactly booted at the same time. Now I've said it, it's gonna to happen to somebody. Understand that when you do the system uptime as the determining factor, it has to be some value greater than one minute. If you reboot your device that you want to be the master, and then you reboot the line cards or the backup or the other switches, and you do that all within the same minute, that criteria goes out the window. Now we can check the uptime and I kind of was sneaky. When I rebooted this switch, I rebooted the other switches and I told them to reboot in five minutes. So I know that they are gonna have a uptime that's lower than the one that has the configuration, which is what we're looking at right now. We just do show system uptime, and we'll see that this has now been up for, what, 23 minutes, uh, 30 minutes, and uh, let's see, yeah, 23 minutes, let's say 24 minutes. And from here, we'll go into the, we're in the show, show system uptime, We'll see this is at 23, 25 minutes. So this is actually time value. So we're gonna look at this value because it says a go. It was 30 minutes in the other one, 25 minutes on this one. We'll see the same here on this box. We're in shell on this one. You can just use the uptime if you're in shell and it'll tell you 26 minutes. So we're where we need to be in terms of what booted first. If you're feeling dicey about your configuration getting lost, you can always do configure and then just type save give it a name, backup.txt, whatever you want. Actually, I'll do conf because that's how I have my name mappings. And that will drop a copy of the config directly into your home directory. So, not really necessary in this case, but we'll do it anyway. Right now, I need to plug in my virtual chassis cables. So I'll pause the video. I'll go plug them in. It's a daisy chain that's actually covered in the documentation, the ways that you want to do this. Um, I'm using uh, half meter 40 gig DAX, I held them up earlier. My process is going to be to plug this switch that has all my config into the switch that's right underneath it, and then maybe count to 10 or 15, and then plug the second switch into the third switch, and then loop the third switch into the first switch, and then come back here and we'll start checking status. And we just wanna let things settle as this convergence takes place. You only go through this once when you plug everything in. There we go. This is what we want to see. These messages that we're seeing here are expected. We're going to have some churn while the synchronization processes are kind of instantiated and that initial sync takes place between the RE and the BK, the master that we're on right now, and the backup, which is this device. You can see here that we have a CLI message at the bottom. And the reason that it is asking us if we wanna restart using the new version is because whenever you log into these devices now, since we're in a VC, they have these new roles. We can see this as a backup. 
And then if we go to number four, and go into the CLI here, we'll see that this will come up as a line card. And you can see that it wants us to be logged into the master. Do not use, do any configurations on not the non-master switches, please. That is not a recipe for success. Now, in terms of how you do interface numbering in a virtual chassis, uh, pretty straightforward. In fact, you can set this up ahead of time before you even build your virtual chassis. I should have done that to just kind of hammer the point home, but trust me, this does work. You can see that I have this member range of one to 20. Uh, I could set a new one, member range, GE, and if I, you know, it'd be one for the BK slash zero slash one to GE dash one slash zero slash 20. That would be the same range of ports on the member one of the virtual chassis, in this case, my BK. And if I wanted to have the same range on the third one, I could do two and two. And that would create that configuration. And again, you can actually, if you're creating a template, have these interfaces configured, even if those virtual chassis members aren't there, and that's not a problem. As soon as the virtual chassis is there, the hardware then becomes available for that configuration and it will become valid. So it's great for baking templates. You can have one that covers all the virtual chassis in your environment, pretty close, right? I mean, you're gonna have nuanced differences like host name and what have you. But if you have the same kind of port map for every switch, this is a great way to just create one template and not have to add in these ports depending on the size of your VC. That's it, that wraps this up. If you have any questions or comments, please put them below. The next videos I do with this virtual chassis are gonna involve importing it into a MIST configuration. That should be pretty interesting. I've done Brownfield on single switches, but not with the virtual chassis support that was just introduced in the last couple months. I'm interested to see how it works, and I hope you are too. Have a great rest of your day, and thanks for stopping by and watching through. Take care.